Welcome to part 7 of this Davon Data tutorial series, a Python crash course. The topic of this video is Python tuples and sets. These two data structures can be thought of as specialized forms of Python lists. Along with Python lists and dictionaries, tuples and sets are fundamental data structures that are used in Python code for analytics and data science. Therefore, learning Python tuples and sets is a necessary step in your journey. As always, please follow along with this video by typing the code that I type. Don't hesitate to pause or rewind the video if needed. You learn Python by writing Python. So once again, I'm in my data structures Jupyter Notebook. I'm just continuing on with the same Jupyter Notebook. And if you're interested in how to set up one of these types of notebooks, check out part four of the series. So I'm gonna go ahead and per my usual, set a markdown cell for the new section here which is going to be hashtag, hashtag tuples. And that's how it's spelled correctly. Now the easiest way to think about tuples is that they are immutable lists. Mutability means that you can change something. So immutable, of course, means they can't be changed. So let's take a look at that. Tuples are immutable lists. They can't be changed. So we can create a tuple, and I'm just going to call this one my tuple. Bad name, but this is a educational course. And how you define a tuple in Python is you use parentheses. Now notice that we're seeing a lot of the same types of characters being overused or overloaded, if you will, in Python, all based on the context. So we looked at using square brackets for accessing dictionaries in the last video, and we also saw that you use square brackets to define lists in the video before that and parentheses are overloaded as well. So in this particular context, Python knows that this is a tuple. So I'm just gonna go ahead and fill this tuple with some data. And I'm just gonna do single characters here, A, B, C, and let's go ahead and do B. And if I, excuse me, <laughs> if I put the code in like this to create the tuple and then print it out, you can see this. Now, of course, as usual, what we'll do is we'll actually do a print type so we can just explicitly see what kind of type the tuple is, and then we'll just print it out again. So if I run this code, you can see that the my underscore tuple object is of type tuple. So this is the class, this is the blueprint for instantiating tuple objects. And of course you can use this as we've seen in previous videos, but it's not very common to do that. So what you see here in this code up here is more typical. You define a tuple like this. Now tuples are awesome insofar as they're immutable. You might be asking yourself, Dave, if they're just a list, why wouldn't I just use a list instead? And the answer is that because they're immutable, because they can't be changed, they're actually more efficient. They actually take up less space and less processing power in Python. So if you know you need a list of values that's never going to change, then a tuple is a great choice. And a lot of the classes that you work with in analytics and data science with Python do use tuples, by the way. So for example, in text analytics using something called the Natural Language Toolkit or the NLTK in Python uses tuples quite a bit. It's good to know tuples. Now, just like a list, we can access a tuple. Now remember, as I mentioned in the last video, now as I mentioned in the last video, Python starts counting from zero. So if I actually put in one here, I'm not actually getting the first element of the tuple, I'm getting the second element of the tuple. And you can see here, sure enough, I get back B. If I change this to be three, I'll get back B again, but it, what it'll be is the actual fourth or last element in the tuple. And of course, if I go beyond the length of the tuple, I get an error which you know makes some sense. So what we can do here is print len of my tuple. And let's comment that out, that out just for a second here. And we get back four. So I can also call the len or length function on my tuples to see how many elements are in the list. Now notice that this gives me the absolute count. This doesn't tell me the references because remember the references will go through zero, one, two, and three because Python starts counting from zero. So I could, for example, do something funky like this, just so you know. Now we're starting to get, you know, kind of cool with what we're doing with our code here. 
And notice what I get back is I print out the four and I actually get back the B because I've subtracted one off of the length of the tuple and that gives me the last element in the list. Now also notice here, once again, that we're seeing square brackets overloaded. Notice the square brackets here, as with dictionaries, as we saw in the last video, allows me to access a tuple to get out the elements of the tuple. Now, just to prove to you that they're immutable, you can't change a tuple. So let's say, hey, let's grab my tuple. Let's access index one, which is the second index. I'm gonna change, I wanna change that from being a B to a Z. If I run that, I get back an error. It says, look, tuple objects do not support item assignment. They are immutable. All you can do is replace an existing tuple with a brand new tuple. And that's basically all you need to know right now for tuples. Pretty simple. Mainly you just wanna understand the data structure, how to access it. Typically don't use tuples a lot necessarily in your code, but a lot of the code that you reuse from other people, like the NLTK, for example, may return back tuples. So knowing what they are and how to work with them is super important, and this is enough for now. Okay, let's move on and let's start talking about sets. So I'm gonna set up a new section here with markdown, hashtag, hashtag sets, run that and we're good to go. So sets can be thought of as being like lists once again, but they only store unique elements and there is no ordering. There's no specific order within a set, just like there's no specific order within a list by default. I can put in different values and different, and they're not necessarily automatically sorted in ascending or descending order. That's what I mean by without order. The easiest way to see sets in action is with some code, not surprisingly. So sets are like lists with unique elements, but without order. Okay, so I can create an object called my set. And we use curly braces to define sets. Now we use curly braces to define dictionaries in the last video. And you might be like, geez, Dave, what's going on here? And the answer is Python is smart. It's contextually sensitive. So if you don't have any key value pairs, like we saw in the last video, then it knows you're trying to create a set and not a dictionary. That's the way it works. So let's do one, uh, four, one, two, three, two, uh, it looks good. So if I run this and then print it out, I get back one, two, three, four. Now notice that I said it doesn't really have any ordering. What happens behind the scenes is that Python goes through this when I create a set and actually normalizes it and actually gives me back the results. Okay, so I can create a set with any sort of ordering, okay? But when Python goes through and says, look, I got some dupes, so I'm gonna dedupe things, it just kind of sorts things by itself, okay? But you should not necessarily assume an order in a set, okay? You definitely don't wanna think about it like that. Now, here's what's really cool about sets. Sets are mutable. You can change them. Let's actually add that to there. So in my set, and then what we can do is we can say, hey, I wanna use a method of behavior on the set object, and it's called, intuitively enough, add. And this is a method of function, a behavior, so we need parentheses, and then we can pass in the data that we would like to add to the set. So if I put in five, let's say, and then just output that, you can see sure enough that I get five added to the set. Now you can also discard stuff. You can actually get rid of stuff in a set. So my set discard three, okay? And then my set, and not surprisingly, when I run that code, three is gone, exactly what you would expect. Now, here's what's really interesting. So you might think that if I try to discard something that isn't in the set, that I would get an error, kind of like what we saw with lists in two videos ago. So no error, unlike lists. So if we say, hey, my set, I want to again discard the number three. It just runs and says, hey, that's no problem. Now, once again, we can use a class as a blueprint. So for example, let's say that we want to, and this is a totally contrived example, of course. The set class is the blueprint for sets. Okay, so I can replace my set with a brand new object. And I can instantiate a new set explicitly by using the set class if I wanted to. And for example, one of the things I can do is I can pass in a list to the set class. And the set class knows how to work with a list and transform it 
quote unquote, if you will, cast it into a set. So one, two, three, four, three, five, uh, zero, let's say. Okay, and then if I output this, whoop, let's go back here, doop, my set. And if I run this, I get back exactly what we would expect. Now, once again, notice that yes, after the set class goes through and removes the duplicate, it tends to put the elements in ascending order, but don't necessarily count on that. So there you have it. That's a really super quick introduction into sets. This is pretty much all you need to know to get started with Python and data science. As usual, of course, if you're done with your work, be sure to save it and then shut down this particular notebook, shut down the Jupyter Notebook server. And if you need detailed instructions on how to do that, check out video number four, because when you're done, you just want to shut everything down and free up the resources Jupyter Notebook is taking on your computer. When you're ready to take your Python game to the next level with some skills in analytics and data science, be sure to check out my free crash courses. And what you can see here at the time of this recording is that I have four free crash courses, one on logistic regression, two on decision trees. These should really be watched together so you get enough skills to actually create a good decision tree machine learning model and cluster analysis. These courses are completely free. They're available on demand, so you register and you can watch them whenever you want. You'll get a PDF of all the slides, you'll get the code as a Jupyter Notebook, and any data as well, so that you can practice the skills that you learned. So when you're ready, this is a great option for you. So if you like the course so far, if you like this video in particular, you found it useful, please give it a like. Also, if you want to be updated as more videos drop for this Crash Course series, please subscribe to the channel. And lastly, if you have friends, family, colleagues that might be interested in learning Python and you think they might enjoy this series, please recommend it to them. Okay, next up in the series here, we're going to learn about Python slicing. This is how you actually slice and dice the data, for example, in a list to get out pieces of data or subsections of the list that you would like. And when that video is ready, you will see a tile here on your screen that will show you where that video is. You just click it and you can watch the next video in the series. So until next time, Please stay healthy, and I wish you very happy data sleuthing.